Hi, I'm Deboki and this is Okie Dokie Boki and I'm just doing a little casual check-in video today. I haven't filmed in a while, which I think is how I start most of my videos these days because I tend to have big gaps between when I film things, but I want to see if, yeah, just doing like a little casual check-in on what I've been watching, what I've been reading, just see how that feels because yeah, I kind of miss making videos. Uh, last time I filmed, I was in Oslo. I was in Norway and that was for the fall. It was a great time. I loved Norway, would totally go back, but we had to leave sometime. And so we left at the end of 2022. Currently we are in Austin now for the second part of my husband's sabbatical. And it's been very fun. I love Austin. My husband's family is from Austin. He grew up here. So we've come to Austin plenty and it's nice to get to spend a longer time to get to eat all of the very good food. So that is my very quick recap of where I've been and why I am in a different place than I was last time and I'm still not back home yet. So now just kind of going right into the very, very, very casual recap of what I've been watching and reading lately. Let's start with what I've been watching. Mostly I have just been watching TikToks of the Eras tour because it started this last weekend and like everyone else who cares about Taylor Swift. I I just went on TikTok and almost every TikTok I get right now is the Eras tour. The TikToks that I get that are not the Eras tour are about Arsenal because they have been having such a good season and it's been very exciting. Uh, I guess sidebar, this is not related, but it's a very exciting thing that happened. My husband and I went to London a few weeks ago to watch Arsenal play Everton at their, at home. So exciting. It was the first time we've gotten to see Arsenal play at the Emirates. It was so cool. The game had actually been scheduled for September and like we had planned for this whole thing. We were gonna go to Norway and like the first weekend there, we were gonna then go to the UK to see this game. We like bought the tickets. We were so excited. My husband has loved Arsenal for so long. This was gonna be his moment. And then the queen died. And so that game unfortunately got indefinitely rescheduled. I don't know if that's the right way to phrase it. I mean, it got technically canceled, I guess, but like they, they were obviously not fully canceling it. And we've just been waiting forever to find out when the actual reschedule date was. So finally, we got it. <laughs> we got it like three weeks before, which is wild to me because they must know that so many people are coming to watch this game from abroad. Like we know that that was happening because when we went, we actually went in September because like we had already booked the hotel and the flights and everything. And so we showed up to do the stadium tour because we were like, what else are we going to do? Like, this is what our plan was. And there were so many other people who were also coming in from abroad because like, they had gotten tickets and that was gonna be their day. So it kind of, I kind of wish that they had not in like, when I say they, I mean just like in this broad day, like I think it, maybe it's down to the Premier League and to the teams. I know that scheduling is a nightmare because the Premier League and everyone just has so many games. So I understand, but it was just, it was very stressful to have to wait so long for like such short notice of when the game was gonna actually happen. But we were able to go, we were so paranoid that something else was gonna get in the way, but like we got to go, we got to see the game. It was incredible. It was so exciting. Anyways, that's my sidebar. I guess technically I've been watching a lot of Arsenal. My TikToks, there are Arsenal edits, their Eras tour. Everything else is just cat videos and people that are yelling about other people on TikTok that I don't really care about. So yeah, that is my TikTok feed right now. The other thing that I've been watching and I basically binged it this weekend was The Glory, which is this Korean drama on Netflix that did really well. And to be honest, I was very surprised by how much I enjoyed The Glory. It's written by the writer for Descendants of the Sun and Guardians, and I did not really like either of those shows that much. I know they're super popular, but I just found them very, very aimless and boring. Like they have very charismatic leads in them, but other than that, like, I just really, really didn't care for them that much. So I went into this very, very skeptical. The main reason I decided to give it a shot is because it's a revenge show. And that is like, I love a good K-drama revenge show because they're just so satisfying a lot of the time. Sometimes they like kinda, I don't know, they get a little bit like whiffy on the end, but this one I was like hoping for good things because people have been really hyping it up. So I watched it. I really, really enjoyed it. 
I would highly recommend it. Um, there's a few things that I'll say. So it is a show. So the show itself is about this woman who was bullied in high school and has basically spent the rest of her life setting up a very, very elaborate revenge on the very rich people who like the, the rich kids basically in her class who were bullying her and especially one mean girl in particular who was especially awful to her. And like, it's one of those shows where like, you just have to really buy into the idea that revenge is something you can pursue in a healthy way at this level, because it is, she has gone hardcore in her revenge. And I really appreciated it. Like, I, I like, I, I acknowledge that maybe a lot of these feelings are not the healthiest to like fully indulge in that way. But for a TV show, like for a show where you just want catharsis, it is so satisfying. And I also really love the casting. The casting of the leads is so good. Um, actually, the casting of everyone, especially when they're doing flashbacks to like young actors to the, like the the older actors, there's such good casting in the physicality. Like the 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 a lot of these characters really look like they're younger. Versions. Versions. Like whoever did that casting, like good job just on getting the resemblance down. But also a lot of the mannerisms and stuff work really well across the, the age gap, I guess, or whatever, across the younger version and older versions of these characters. I just was really, really impressed with that. Um, and also I really love the casting for the plastic surgeon guy because he's this character, he's like the other lead, he's the male lead of the show and there is like a, a romance thing there and I think the balance of the romance to the actual revenge storyline is really good. But also as a character he's really kind of interesting because he also has this like inner darkness that we start to see unravel over the show. We start to see, um, we start to learn more about who he is and it's not necessarily exactly who you think he is in the beginning but the casting for him works so well for that where he has this perfect face for seeming like a chipper happy kind of guy who's just like wants to help the main actress but also as these layers get revealed about him I think the actor just did such a great job of capturing that that combined darkness and goodness in the character in the conflict between that for him and how that relates to his relationship to the main character who is just so all in and just never wavers she like she has strong convictions about what she's going to do and I really like that the point of the show was not to question those convictions because I know that happens in a lot of revenge shows and that's not the point of this one. The point of this one is almost more how does her journey through this revenge actually in a weird way help other people and kind of work with them to help them deal with shitty parts of their lives it's it's really it's really good the the one major caveat i will say I had to fast forward through most of the high school flashbacks they get pretty i i would like I've watched gory, gruesome things before. There was something about these scenes that were very uncomfortable and I don't necessarily dispute the need to include them because I do think there's something about their inclusion that like even fast forwarding, I was like, holy shit. And like, I could see that that would totally drive me to like these kinds of lengths. So I, I do think that they do something for the characters, um, both for the hero of the story and also the villains to kind of like show just how how they are as kids and why it sets up the relationships that they have um, as adults. But it's hard and it gets to a point where it's just brutal and maybe kind of done too much. And I just, I couldn't watch a lot of them. So I did fast forward through a lot of those scenes and I don't think I really lost that much. So if you're in the same boat, like that's what I would recommend if you're interested in the show but are kind of uncomfortable with the idea of there being these gruesome flashback scenes featuring, you know, kids basically. Like I you can fast forward through them and I think you'll still be able to get everything else that the show is getting across. So that's what I've been watching. Now on to what I've been reading. I will say I've talked a lot in recent videos about being in a weird place with reading. And I, in particular over the last year, I feel like most of my reading has been for nonfiction book club and then basically a bunch of like books that I have no interest in talking about because they're kind of just like my Kindle Unlimited. I'm in a headspace of just needing books that feel like words, like they're not necessarily great books, they're not bad books. And you know, the authors are not necessarily working with like a whole publishing arm that I feel like is gonna help them out with editing and marketing and everything. So it just feels kind of silly to like be judging them according to any kind of standard that I usually would for a 
public kind of book review situation. Like, and moreover, I just like wasn't in the mood to talk about books. I've had a lot going on the past like year, year and a half, I guess. And I just like, I, I wasn't very interested in finding a lot of books and talking about a lot of books. So yeah, I think nonfiction book club was a really good way for me to keep reading and keep reading in a way that was fun and that was public and that involved discussion because those are things that I do love. Like I do love talking about books but I just needed kind of a limited structured way to do that. With that said, I feel like I'm starting to kind of be able to lay the groundwork for reading again for booktube or for a more public kind of thing, whatever, I don't know. So there's a few aspects to that. So for work, I've been reading The Possibility of Life, a Science Imagination and Our Quest for Kinship in the Cosmos by Jamie Green. Um, this is an upcoming release. It comes out in April, uh, April 18th, 2023. So I was reading this for Tiny Matters, the science podcast that I co-host with Sam Jones for the American Chemical Society. And we're actually gonna be interviewing Green this week. So I'm really excited for that interview. It'll be coming out later, so. I'll post about the episode somewhere where when when it's actually done. Um, but in this book, uh, Green is talking about how science and science fiction kind of reflect the ways that we see life on this planet, but also like through the lens of how we think about life on other planets. It's been a really inter interesting dive into like culture and science combined, which is a thing that I always love getting a chance to talk about. And it's been really interesting for me to read as someone who, weirdly enough, actually doesn't really read that much sci-fi. Like most of my sci-fi consumption is probably very like on the light end of sci-fi. I don't know what the word for it is. That is the extent to which I don't really know that much about sci-fi because yeah, it's just not a genre that I have interacted with. Uh, a whole lot more with beyond like, I don't know, watching like Star Wars and Firefly and maybe a handful of books. So it has been one of my goals to actually try to get more into sci-fi because I feel like a, it just seems very cool. And B, I just also feel like as a science writer, there's so much opportunity to learn about how people think about science and how they, people imagine it um, in these fictional ways. So that is, I don't know, broadly a thing that I've just been thinking about. And so reading this book was kind of a cool way to, to, to start to dive into that from a, like a more guided perspective. And this year, I also signed up to judge the booktube prize, which I've done the past two years, but let the, those two years, I've only judged the nonfiction section. This year, I decided to challenge myself to also judging the fiction section. So I put my name down as an option for both and just was kind of like, wherever you tell me to go, I will go. So right now I am reading uh, a few books for that, all of them basically, because I am super behind on my book two prize reading. Uh, I am always behind on my book two prize reading. Currently I'm reading Lucy by the Sea by Elizabeth Strout. I'm not gonna say anything about my feelings about it right now. We'll talk about my book two prize feelings later. I am really glad that I, I decided to challenge myself to the fiction section this year because I had a lot of, uh, I don't know, not anxiety or insecurity, but I had some like doubts about whether or not I should be doing it just because I read so much more nonfiction and I feel like I'm able to approach nonfiction with more of a sense of what I'm looking for it. Like I kind of know how I approach judging nonfiction and I don't, especially in the past few years, like in the beginning of like when I started booktube and like a while ago, I used to read a lot more fiction more regularly. And just in the past few years, my fiction reading has kind of siloed into mostly romance reading. And so I just was kind of like, you know, am I the right person to be judging the fiction books? But I just kind of decided to let go of that and just go for it. Because one of the things that I really liked about doing the judging for the nonfiction booktube prize sections was that it helped me reach that point of kind of understanding more of what I'm looking for in, uh, in nonfiction. And so I was kind of curious if that would happen with me for the fiction section as well and I'm you know jury's out on whether or not that's true or not but I do feel like it's been good for me to challenge myself for reading a lot of fiction that I might not usually pick up which is also the other thing that I liked about judging the nonfiction sections before it just really helped push me into reading nonfiction books I might not have thought about reading before so I think a lot of the stuff that I have loved about judging the nonfiction book sections applies to my experience so far of judging the fiction sections. And I'm, I'm really excited to keep going with it and to see kind of, yeah, how all of the, the books shape out this year and to see what ultimately wins. With that said, 
I am also still reading the romance. I am enjoying the romance. So there are two books in particular that I want to highlight from my reading so far this month. Um, the first is Fire Season by Katie Casey, which is a romance. Uh, it is, I just said they're a romance. It's a baseball romance novel. It is between two pitchers on the same team. And I had read her book, Unwritten Rules, before, and a lot of people loved it. It didn't quite hit me. But when I read this book, I feel like there was that moment that sometimes you just need with certain writers, especially romance writers, where like the things just kind of click, where you kind of like get the writing and it's just, you know, it's it's nothing scientific, it's nothing logical, it's just somehow the pieces fit and it all makes sense. And so that's what happened to me with Fire Season, where it was like, oh, what she's doing suddenly makes a lot more sense to me. And so I actually went back to revisit Unwritten Rules after reading Fire Season and I loved it. So I am now fully on board the Katie Casey train and I'm really excited about her upcoming book and I'm curious to see just like how this whole series is going to go. It still hasn't convinced me to become a regular baseball fan, but it did help me appreciate a lot of the stuff that goes into baseball and uh, I don't know, the dramatic things that, that happen in the sport aside from fictional romances. The other book that I read is from an author who I actually had a similar experience with. Uh, this is KJ Charles. Um, her new book is The Secret Lives of Country Gentlemen. And it's so funny because I remember like KJ Charles is like, if you think of queer historical romance, she is like the, the God, <laughs> the, the, uh, the epitome of the genre. That's not the right way to say it, but like, and I feel like I should be able to come up with the right phrase anyways. I haven't thought of the right way, but I, the first few times that I read her books, they didn't quite land. And then finally, suddenly everything clicked and she is my auto buy author. I will defend her at all costs. I don't know who I would need to defend her from because I think mostly it's just from people who probably like me before just didn't fully get her writing before, but I get it now and I love it. Her books are so good. And so anytime a new book comes out by KJ Charles, it's like put everything down, gotta read it. And so even though I have this book two prize set of books that I really need to finish, I just knew that this book was gonna be high on my priority list and I really loved it. The thing with romance writers that sometimes I struggle with. There are some romance writers that if you've been with me on this channel for a long time, you'll probably know that there are authors who I used to talk about a lot and who I don't really talk about as much because I don't really get excited about their books when they come out because I just kind of hit a point where all of their books started to feel the same and same in the ways that the flaws became especially emphasized. And I think it's just a thing that happens. Like a lot of times romance writers, they have a particular set of rhythms, they have a particular set of beats, they have a particular set of like character types. And after a certain amount of time, depending on the author, those things can just become very repetitive. And the thing I've noticed is KJ Charles's latest set of books, like the past few releases, a lot of them have been very similar in some of the uh, little basic pieces. There's always like a rich dude who has daddy issues. There is a lovable rogue. There's probably some kind of tension, betrayal, miscommunication between them. And a lot of the book is going to be very focused on getting them to work through that miscommunication and getting them to understand how to talk to each other and how to understand each other and see life across these barriers of class or whatever. Like just you know, basic personality issues. Like these kinds of things are gonna be a huge part of the story. And I think the reason it all works is because I always just love the characters that she writes. In this case, in the case of Secret Life of Country Gentlemen, we've got the lovable rogue who is a smuggler. He's like the head of this smuggling clan. And so he's just got all this like, weird family stuff he has to manage because it's like a crime family. So, you know, it's the usual family dynamics magnified by crime. And then on the other hand, you've got the, the, the rich dude with daddy problems and his daddy problem is that his dad basically abandoned him when he was a kid and yet somehow he has inherited his estate and now he has to kind of confront the legacy of the selfishness of his father towards him, but also to uh, basically the rest of the, the family that he is now discovering he has. And so it's a lot for both of them to deal with. And so there's the tension of like, just like one is the smuggler, one is the baronet, but there's also like issues of they were previously lovers and how they have accidentally been reunited. I loved it. I love, I love the way Way that KJ Charles writes these characters. I love the way that she writes them having to learn to be functional adults in a relationship with each other. So yeah, 
I just really loved it. So I would recommend that if you're looking for kind of a nice, I don't know, end of winter sort of situation. There's also a lot of nature in the book and so that was really fun. It was very cute to have the baronet be like this nerdy little naturalist who is just exploring the marshes and, and trying to catalog all the wildlife he sees. So yeah, that is my reading and watching for the week. Next week, if I do this again, I will hopefully have more book two prize reading done. I will hopefully almost be done with Bittersweet and we'll see what I'll watch. I'm not really sure. <laughs> what I'm going to be watching next. I started watching Reborn Rich, which is another Korean, I think, revenge-y kind of show. So I'm very excited about that. And yeah, thanks you guys for watching. Bye.